Hey Amen. What a wonderful, amazing opportunity we have here today. Uh, I am so glad to be here uh, celebrating this with my dear brother in the Lord, uh, Malcolm. He is really precious to me, and the Lord has really put us together in a special way. He's been uh, an encouragement to me over the years, and uh, uh, I think um, some time ago, I think I think maybe our very first phone call, we we. Uh, we were talking, and somehow the subject of union with Christ came up, and uh, we kind of nerded out on that doctrine, you know, and, and I said to myself, this is my brother right here, you know, he's a man after my own heart, and, uh, and we have just stayed connected over the years, and um, I'm so grateful to have an opportunity to participate in this special moment. Um, he's a real gift to this congregation. He's been a gift to my life. And I, and I just want to say before anything else, um, you are uniquely blessed to have Malcolm Foley laboring in your midst, a man that has really dedicated his life to loving the Lord and to loving the Lord's people. There is a word from the Lord on this afternoon, um, and uh, it comes from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, I'd like us to consider together just one verse. 1 Timothy chapter 4, just one verse. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn you, preachers have a way of reading a short passage and preaching a long sermon. <laughs> so don't let one verse fool you. But I'm going to I'm gonna try to cut this short today. I'm going to try to preach a short passage and, and uh, read a short passage and preach a short sermon. So we'll see how I do. 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 12. This is God's word. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. Today's passage finds the Apostle Paul offering a pastoral charge to, to a younger minister named Timothy and the congregation that he is called to serve. For three and a half chapters, uh, Paul has really been laying out apostolic credentials, ecclesial strategies, doctrinal lessons meant to help Timothy guide him along the way in his calling to the church at Ephesus. As we reach chapter 4, verse 12, Paul turns his attention from Timothy's doctrine to Timothy's life. He makes a shift from Timothy's doctrine to Timothy's life. And the life of any gospel minister really forms an important part of their ministry. As Paul will say in verse 16, Timothy needed to keep a close watch not only on the teaching but on himself as well. As Richard Baxter, Puritan Richard Baxter warned, warned young ministers not to unsay with their lives what they have said with their mouths. And so the, the, the life of the minister is really an important corroborating witness meant to adorn the gospel. So in 1987, a toy company named Milton Bradley, some of y'all may have heard, heard of Milton Bradley, they, they released the U.S. version of a game which originated in Ghana, West Africa. And the Ghanaian name of that game was called Kajinga, which means to build, to build. After shortening the name to Jenga, Milton Bradley began marketing this game, which many of us know. And the goal of Jenga, if you've ever played Jenga, uh, is, is to build a tower up with one hand while avoiding toppling the tower over with the other hand. And the goal, beloved, of gospel ministry is to build the saints up with our words without toppling them over with our lives. We're called to build them up with love, peace, patience, gentleness, and self-control without toppling them over with bullying, combativeness, unkindness, immaturity, greed, slander, or licentiousness. Gospel doctrine and life must work together toward the same goal of building the saints up to the glory of God. 
And so today, by God's grace, I'd like us to briefly consider what a corroborating, a gospel corroborating life looks like, a, a, a life that helps to build up the church and builds up God's, God's people, what that life looks like. And I'm just going to have two points on today. My very first point uh, about what a gospel corroborating life looks like from this passage is, number one, a gospel corroborating life is a respected life, a respected life. Now, that's interesting. Some of y'all are probably raising your eyebrows like right now, like, what is he saying? A respected life. Well, look at what verse 12 says. Verse 12 says, let no one despise you for your youth. Let no one despise you for your youth. The Greek word translated despise is the Greek word katafreneo. Repeat after me, katafreneo. All right, good. Y'all doing good on Greek. Katafreneo means literally to look down on someone, or to discount someone, or to devalue someone, or to, or to think less of them, or think little of them. And, and, and isn't that surprising that, that when the Apostle Paul is giving instructions to this young minister, Timothy, about, uh, about how to live his life amongst the church, the very first thing he says to Timothy is, don't let them look down on you. Don't let them look down on you. Don't let them count you out over petty things. Don't let them devalue you. Timothy was a young man in his 30s. And and, and in that culture, he would have been surprisingly young for a pastor or a teacher. And Paul has to say, don't let them discount you or devalue you because your gospel ministry doesn't fit their cultural expectations. You see, they, they didn't culturally expect someone uh, in their culture uh, to, to, uh, of Timothy's age to be functioning in gospel ministry. And so, and so Paul has to say, listen, don't let them count you out because you don't meet their cultural expectations. Don't let them discount you because you're too young. Don't let them discount you because you're not their same ethnicity. Don't let them discount you because you're not from their town. Don't let them discount you because you're not from their tribe. Don't let them discount you. Because, Timothy, your gospel ministry is not your own. You're not here in your own name. You see, you you, you represent King Jesus. You represent his kingdom and his gospel. And, and 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 so if they discount you, they will have been discounting something about Jesus. They would have been discounting Jesus' emissary, Jesus' messenger. And, and, and the, 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 the language, don't let them despise you, don't let them discount you, that's shocking to us when we hear that. Because of the truth that it says about us. What Paul is saying about the church is that they are prone to discount you. Amen. <laughs> Listen, here's the thing about the Bible. The Bible will tell the truth on you, even if you don't tell the truth on yourself. God will tell the truth on you. God will pull the veil on you. And the Holy Spirit knows the real hearts and the real minds of God's people. And so when God speaks through the Apostle Paul to Timothy, he's saying, listen, these folks are prone to discount you over petty things. The Lord knows sometimes we can struggle to hear a message simply because of who it's coming from. I've often heard sisters say, when I have an idea... I have to find a man to say it. Come on, somebody. In order for it to be taken seriously. And that's how we can sometimes act. We can sometimes discount a message merely because of the messenger that is delivering it. And Paul is warning Timothy that there are folks, listen, that there are folks who are just not going to receive it from you, Timothy. Because you don't fit their cultural expectations, because they see you as too young, because they see you as too this or too that or too the other thing. But I want you to notice how Paul doesn't tell Timothy to come back home and swap out with another older, more culturally acceptable ministry. No, 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 no. Uh, He says to Timothy, you don't let them discount you. You stay right there, Timothy. Because your calling among them, Timothy, it was no mistake. God didn't make no mistake when you were installed in the church in Ephesus, Timothy. And God didn't make no mistake as Malcolm Foley's being installed in this church. I want you to understand that what's happening today is not something that we are doing. It's something that Jesus is doing through his church. He is the one that is installing Malcolm Foley. It is his ministry that is happening here, you see. And it's no mistake. 
Timothy's installation as a pastor in that church was no mistake because these very folks needed to receive the gospel ministry through Timothy, through the very person that they were likely to discount. And sometimes God will send you a messenger that comes from a a, a different people group that might be younger than you expected, that might be from the other side of town or or whatever it is, and, and he's doing it, he's doing it intentionally to get you to see something about Jesus that you otherwise wouldn't see unless you heard it through this messenger. And so he says, don't don't, don't let them discount you. Don't let them look down on you because because they're going to want to suggest that you're too immature, that you're too experienced. They're going to want to paternalistically pat you on the head and say, "This, this this is how we do it in the Reformed and Presbyterian world. But, 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 But don't let them do that to you. Because they need the gospel more than they realize, and they need it coming from you more than they realize. And and here's the thing. Here's the good news about Jesus. The good news about Jesus is that Jesus, King Jesus, loves us too much to let our pettiness stand in the way of our holiness. (laughs) Jesus loves you too much to let your pettiness and my pettiness stand in the way of our holiness. And so the inspired word comes to Timothy, don't let them discount you. They're going to want to throw up every kind of barrier to their own learning and growth and maturity, and you don't let them do it because Jesus loves these people too much. He loves them too much. And so he instructs Timothy in this way. And here, you know, it's interesting, you have a special opportunity to fulfill these words as you install an African-American, a black Presbyterian pastor that may not fit the cultural mode of what many imagine a Presbyterian pastor to be. This man is not Ligon Duncan. This man is not Sinclair Ferguson. And thank the Lord for that. But it's the same Jesus working through Malcolm Foley as it is working through Ferguson or Duncan or all the rest of them. And even though it may come in a a package that you might not necessarily have expected, it is the same Jesus nonetheless. You know, one thing I love about being back here in Texas, besides Whataburger and that amazing ketchup, (laughs) And I got several packages from the airport. I was like, you know, people just walking past those packages. I said, what are y'all doing? This is gold right here. We don't have this in Nashville. We've got a lot of good things, but we don't have that ketchup. Is that in Texas, y'all know how to do barbecue well. I know I got an amen on that one. And my younger brother, Vernon, he lives in Austin. And last time we visited, Vernon told me that I had to go to Franklin Barbecue. Y'all, so I see some testimonies out there. Y'all know about Franklin's Barbecue. And so I looked it up. I looked up Franklin's Barbecue on the Internet and found out that Franklin's Barbecue is, is, like, is considered to be one of the best barbecue spots in the country. And, uh, and I mean, there are people that get, they get T-shirts and take pictures in front of Franklin's Barbecue. And, and, but, but, you know, it's interesting that, that Franklin's Barbecue, this place that's, that's, is almost world-renowned for its food, it, it comes in a much different package than you might expect. I went to Franklin's Barbecue expecting this big old place, and, and, and Franklin's Barbecue is this small shack of a place that's only got like seven tables, and it's got a long line, and folks are just waiting to get into that place to, to get this barbecue. And, 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 there were, and then when I got there, and, then, and you know, you have to like a six-hour wait, and, and my brother and I, we sort of took turns kind of trading off to finally get in there, and we finally got in there and ate it. And then when I got in there, I noticed that there were no serving trays. I'm like, where are the serving trays? But instead of a serving tray, when we ordered our meal and it finally came out, they brought out and lugged out a huge plastic bag (laughs) that was filled with meat and all kind of steam and juices. And then when they opened it up, I realized that wonderful things can come in unexpected packages. And beloved, in gospel ministry, wonderful things can come in unexpected packages. And never forget, beloved, that we serve a Messiah who intentionally came among us in a culturally unexpected package. 
Isaiah declared of him, he had no stately form or majesty to attract us, no beauty that we should desire him. Born to a poor peasant family in a stable and having grown up on the backside of nowhere, Christ came among us in an unexpected package. And there's some wonderful things that you can learn from a minister who comes to you in a culturally unexpected package. First of all, you can learn this. You can learn cultural humility. You can learn cultural humility. When you regularly receive gospel ministry through people of a different culture, it can cause you to appreciate their culture and learn to share space with them. To learn to sit uh, under the authority of someone that you might not sit under the authority with any other way in, in, in life, out here in society. You can, you can learn that everything does not have to cater to your cultural preferences all the time. Amen. Especially if you live in a society where everywhere else in society, it caters to your cultural preferences. When you come in the household of faith and you hear a minority declare the gospel, when you hear the minority uh, uh, declare God's grace over your life, listen, it can really disciple you in all kinds of ways to learn to share space to learn to put someone else's preferences before your own, to learn to bear someone else's burdens. I, 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 have, I have a, a dear brother uh, in, in, in back in Nashville, Tennessee, and I happen to pastor a church that is Cross-Cultural Presbyterian Church in Nashville, and, uh, and, and we have lots of uh, precious white saints in, 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 the, in the congregation. And one of them in particular, a, a, a white brother in particular, said one, one day, he said, uh, he said, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful being in a church with lots of different kinds of people and where the music doesn't always reflect my preferences. He said, because everywhere else I go, everything is catered to me. And, 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 and one day in my week, it's good for me to have to wait on somebody else, for me to have to, for me to, have to, to, to consider someone else's preferences. And this is what he said to me. He said, you know, this is helping me serve my wife better. This is helping me serve my children better. This is helping me learn humility better. And so you have not just the general gospel blessing that the Lord gives whenever any kind of gospel minister comes into its midst, but you have a unique blessing coming right here. God, God has uniquely favored this congregation with some unique discipleship and, and some unique spiritual growth that you will get as you sit under his ministry. Here's another thing you can learn. Here's another wonderful thing you can get from this gospel minister coming in a culturally unexpected package, you can learn to distinguish biblical principles from cultural preferences. You know, the folks in Ephesus would have thought that elders and pastors were always supposed to be older men because, because that, that's just what they had seen in society and, and, and what they thought they'd seen in Scripture until young Timothy shows up. This 30-something-year-old man, fresh out of seminary, shows up with apostolic backing. <laughs> so they couldn't discount him because he came with a letter from the Apostle Paul. <laughs> they didn't want to hear what he had to say. They didn't want to sit under his ministry, but here come Paul to back him up. And Paul says, sends this letter to Timothy and through Timothy to the church saying, don't let them despise your youth. And, it, and you, can you catch that, how, how, Paul, how, how Paul is saying it to Timothy in their hearing? You know how that is, you know? When, when you, you know, you, you, you know, you're not saying it directly to the person, but you, you really are saying it to them. And, and that's what Paul is doing to the church in Ephesus right now, is he's writing this letter to Timothy. He's really speaking to the whole church. God sends a servant from another culture. It helps us to clarify and distinguish things that we thought were gospel from things that are just preferences. And as you receive Malcolm's ministry, some of you may be hearing things that you've never heard before. And it may be challenging you in some ways that you've never been challenged before. But you ought to, but I, listen, I want to encourage you to embrace that. I want to encourage you to lean into that. Because, because insofar as he is challenging you in ways that you've never been challenged before from the scriptures, 
you are actually growing to be more like Jesus. You, 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 you're seeing things about Jesus that you've never seen before. You're learning about Jesus' passion and concern for justice and mercy and compassion that maybe you've never even knew about before. And, and, and that's, a, that's a good growth. That, that, that's a good, that's a good, that's a, that, listen, if you feel, if you feel a little sting, that that's the sting of growth. That's the sting of a stretch. That's the sting of you, of you coming out of your comfort zone to look more like, talk more like, love more like, think more like Jesus. And that's what we want. That's what we want. We don't, we don't want to just be, we don't want to just be in our culture. Well, we do want to be in our cultural comfort zones, but, 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 but Jesus wants us to grow. Jesus wants us to be holy. Jesus wants us, he wants our good, okay? And so he will send us something to cause us to mature and to grow up. And so, beloved, I've come now to my last point. The first point I made was that the, the gospel corroborating life is a respected life. But finally, the gospel corroborating life is also a respectable life. Not just a respected life, but a respectable life. Look at what he says. He says, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Paul not only tells Timothy, don't let them discount you, he now offers Timothy a practical strategy to resist being discounted. A strategy that he offers to avoid having Timothy be looked down, and the strategy to avoid being looked down upon is to live a life worthy of being looked up to. He begins with talking about speech. He says, but set an example for the believers in speech, in speech, speech. Paul wants Timothy to offer a contrast to some negative teachers, some negative influences that have infiltrated the church. And Paul has already been talking about doctrine. And, you know, it's interesting because what people will do here is they'll say, well, you know, speech just means, you know, the content of what you say in your doctrine. But Paul has already been talking about doctrine. And, and, and he's about to talk about doctrine again later. But, but right here he's talking about not just what you say, but how you say it. The gospel minister has got to be careful about how they say what they say. You see? It's not enough just to proclaim truth. You got to proclaim it in a Christ-like way. You got to proclaim it in a, in, a, in, a, in a loving, in a kind, in a compassionate way, in a pleading way, in a concerned way. And Paul here is talking about things like filthy language and slander and argumentativeness, which were hallmarks of the false teachers. He is saying, Timothy, don't be a Twitter troll. Don't let that be you. Don't, don't, let, don't, 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 don't you be the one that, that goes on in, in, in an anonymous way. You just show up looking for a fight. And some of us, listen, beloved, there are way too many ministers that are just out there looking for a fight. Who can I tear down next? Who can I insult next? Who can I belittle next in the name of truth? And, and, and Paul said, that can't be you. You, you can't be known as, as a pugnacious elder, a pugnacious pastor. Don't be known as a, a liar, a gossip, a slanderer. Don't, don't argue back and forth with people and mock people or ridicule them or use malicious words. Listen, whatever the negative things the folks, the talking heads are doing out in the world, let your speech be a contrast to that. If they're spewing injustice, you speak justly. If they're, if they're speaking unkindly, you speak mercifully and compassionately. And, and, and you be an example, not only in speech, but in conduct and in love. Be an example in love. You know, and being an example means that you are out in front of the congregation. Did y'all know that? So what Malcolm is called to do, and what every gospel minister is called to do, is they are called to lead the congregation in loving people. Which means, 
that they're going to be pointing to some people that you might not be thinking about loving until they point to them. They're going to be talking about some issues and some ways of loving people that you might not have even considered until they brought it up. And, and listen, and, and just because you've never heard it said in church doesn't mean it shouldn't be said in church. <laughs> just because you've never heard it discussed in church doesn't mean it shouldn't be discussed because the calling is to be an example in love, to lead the congregation in love, to be out on the forefront of love, seeing people that no one else sees, caring for people that no one else cared for, talking about suffering that no one else is concerned about. And, and that was the example of Jesus, wasn't it? Jesus was out in front in loving people. Who ever heard of touching a leper until King Jesus came along and touched the untouchable and, and, and cared for, for, for the invisible and, and, folk, and folks that no one else cared about, the marginalized and the poor and the oppressed and the scandalous? Jesus forgave the unforgivable. Jesus blessed the unblessable. Jesus centered folks who were on the margin, you see. And that's what gospel ministry is supposed to be. We're supposed to be an example, leading the congregation in loving others, not trailing behind them. You ever heard of, a, of I've, heard, I've heard of pastors who, who, who people are in front of them in loving folks. Who, who people come to them and say, hey, well, what about the undocumented people, pastor? I never hear you talking about that. Well, what about the, what, what about the, what about the, what about the minority people, pastor? I never hear you talking about that. And listen, beloved, if we're always trying to play the middle on everything, then we can't be out in front of the congregation and loving people. You see, Jesus wasn't concerned about just being in the middle. Jesus was concerned about representing the kingdom of God and establishing the kingdom of God and, and, and exemplifying God's love to, toward people that, that everybody thought were unlovable. And so we've got to be out front on that. And, and, and may they always say, let them say this. Let them say, I would have never thought about loving this person or that person or doing these acts of love and justice and mercy until Malcolm brought it up, until Pastor Slim brought it up. I would have never considered this suffering or that pain or that form of injustice until Malcolm or Pastor Slim uh, showed us what the love of Christ looked like toward these people that society had rendered invisible. So we live a life leading in love, and we live a life worthy of respect because, beloved, you are not merely teaching in the pulpit, but you are teaching by example wherever you go. And they are paying more attention about what you do when you're outside of here on Sunday morning than even probably what you're saying up from this pulpit. You have to teach them by the way you live at the grocery store, at the house, at the barber shop, at the gas station, over at Baylor, you're teaching what faith in Christ looks like in practice. It's amazing to me how little we see Jesus in the synagogue in the scriptures. He's in the synagogue, certainly. Jesus, was, Jesus went to church now. Don't, don't get me wrong. Amen. Because you know people... <laughs> You know what people do with that, you know? <laughs> so we don't have to go. Yes, you do have to go to church, okay? Yes, you do. But, but, but we saw Jesus in the highways and the byways and at a wedding in Cana, and, and he was out living life. And his disciples, his apostles, they saw him live life. And, and it's amazing to me that they declared him to be the son of God, and they saw him at a party. And his life at the party was consistent with him being the son of God. They declared him to be the king of kings and lord of lords, and they worshiped him because they saw him live with absolute purity amongst, at, 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 among, listen, among the wine bibbers, among folks, among the dregs of society, sitting amongst tax collectors and prostitutes. And he lived that same consistent holy life amongst all the people wherever he went. And that's the way we have to be. That's the way we have to be. We have to have that same gospel testimony. Gospel living, beloved, it doesn't prove the truth of the gospel, but it adorns the gospel as a blood-bought gift of God's love. 
gospel living is like the it's like it's like it's like it's like the star that God put on the Christmas tree. It's like the lights that He put around the Christmas tree. I, you know, I'll never forget when I was driving on I forty in Nashville some years ago. I looked up at a sign, and it, I mean, it was shocked. I, I actually almost had an accident. I looked up at this sign, this billboard, and on this billboard there were there, there it suspended in midair. There were two cows with paintbrushes in their, in their hooves with the words, eat more chicken. And, 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 and that sign did not make the chicken. That sign did not make the restaurant, but that sign, like a flashing neon light, called attention to the chicken. And that's what our lives are supposed to do like a flashing neon sign, like a Chick-fil-A sign that everybody stops and looks at. Our lives are meant to call out to the Lord's people, get more Jesus. Get more Jesus. Wherever we, whether we are at home, get more Jesus. Out on the street, get more Jesus. With our families, get more Jesus. With our friends, get more Jesus. On the internet, get more Jesus. In the voting booth, get more Jesus. Wherever we go, our lives are meant to call out like a billboard, like a placard. Get more Jesus. And that's my prayer for you, my brother. My prayer for you is that your life will always adorn the gospel, Malcolm. That your life will always declare to these precious saints, get more Jesus. And may the saints right here always be led to get more Jesus as you labor and as you serve among them. Amen.